Hey, 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 Soul Tribe. Welcome back. This is episode 1.16 of Beyond Deconstructing. T.J. Mika Polk, affectionately known as Deconstructing Nero. Thank you guys so much for coming back to another episode of Beyond Deconstructing. I'm super excited for today's guest, Tori Anderson. Um, And I'm sorry, I didn't even ask if I should say your whole name or not, but I kind of just name dropped you. So, (laughs) Tori, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and let everyone know who you are. Cool, cool, cool. I know it's fine. Tori Anderson. I actually like, um, I never really identified with my name. Like I never really connected with it. And then I was ski touring with someone we were talking about names. Cause there's like some Epic names out there. And like, I have emotional reactions to words. And he was like, your name sounds like a pro athlete's name, like Tori Anderson. I was like, Oh, I've never thought about it being received that way. Okay, cool. Which was funny. And I was like, I always thought my last name is like the next most generic last name to Smith, like classic white person last name. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, my name is Tori Anderson. I am a 29 year old, uh, female presenting non-binary person who found out that they were autistic at 28 years old, um, which was pretty wild. I, just got my clinical diagnosis actually a couple of weeks ago, um, was self-diagnosed up until then. And I accidentally blew up on TikTok exploring <laughs> autism. Um, I also have a degree in marketing, um, a bachelor's degree in business with a major in marketing and a minor in entrepreneurship and innovation. So part of getting onto Twitter was to actually test some uh, analytic uh, and like algorithm strategies that I had been assessing and it worked. <laughs> accidentally and I have 42,000 followers, which is weird. Um, but yeah, outside of that, I'm a skier. I'm an activist and intersectional feminist in the outdoor industry. Um, I created, accidentally created a, a feminist movement. Um, it's called Womb Tang. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it started out as a school project and we had to create and manage, a, um, create and manage a social media account. And it just kind of took off and now we're pushing 10,000 followers and we have factions all across uh, North America with leaders and we're hosting events and we're looking at um, figuring out how to register uh, part of our business as a nonprofit and building scholarships for marginalized groups and uh, people that need barriers to be removed so they can access the outdoors because even though you think the outdoors is inclusive and accessible it's actually not um so mm. yeah my passion for like justice and you know tackling hard topics and feminism i couldn't change the world but this is one area that i could change so that's what i tried to use my degree to do um and i also have a a podcast as well it's called big stick energy the undomesticated outdoor podcast and we have <laughs> heaps of conversations and i've been uh, opening up about my autistic journey on there a bit more as well so if you're interested in like feminism socio political issues um and if you're interested in the outdoors and stuff it's a uh, yeah check it out that's me Awesome sauce. Well, lots and loads and loads of stuff that we're definitely going to be touching on, um, especially um, Womb Tang. I, I love that name. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's been a bit of a journey with that name because it wasn't like, I didn't mean for this to turn into anything. And um, it's definitely like a play on words of Wu Tang. So then there's like cultural appropriation and then also like to be inclusive and intersectional. Not everybody who identifies as a woman has a womb. So it's like, I, we've really had to work on some branding things there as we've like unexpectedly and rapidly grown, but it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, people seem to really identify with it and bond with it. And it's meant to be like unapologetic, disruptive, and kind of sassy, like show up as you are and don't let the industry tell you who you should be. Yes. I love that so much. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that, but I would love if you could share with my audience a little bit more, because I love the unique journeys that autistic people go through to understand themselves as autistic people in this world that is set up by and for 
holistic neurotypical people. Um, if you could just share your your journey with understanding your autism and kind of what it's been like with unmasking. Um, yeah, I it's interesting, like getting the clinical diagnosis. I feel really angry, I guess. Mm. Like validated, but I'm processing a lot of anger, just that the amount of like gaslighting and abuse that I've experienced my whole life. And um, just that like, I, I didn't just need to like try harder or it wasn't lazy or it wasn't selfish. It was just like, no, I'm, I'm disabled and I'm autistic and nobody caught it. I didn't have supports. Um, created a lot of trauma in my life and just kind of processing that and dealing with the the anger that the system kind of failed me and it's failed so many others. Um, and also processing, like getting to know myself for the first time in my life as well. So yeah, I don't know. I have a, it's interesting. I'm having a harder time talking about it now with the clinical diagnosis than when I was self-diagnosed. When I was self-diagnosed, I would info dump to everybody and anybody. And I don't know why that <laughs> changed all of a sudden, <laughs> but um, yeah, my, my journey finding out I was autistic, I've been trying to figure out why I'm different since I was in grade one. I never really connected with other kids um, the way that I would watch like my sister play with friends. And um, I spent a lot of time by myself. I really, I loved fantasy. I had like these in-depth fantasy worlds I would live in. And um, I loved animals and my special interests were like anime and uh, like, lizards. I, I actually just got a lizard again. His name's Norman. He's Euromastix and I love him. But uh, nice. plants and I love to like move my body. I jump on the trampoline for hours. And I just like, I, at school, it's like, I would watch kids on the playground and I just like, I didn't really, I didn't know how to join in with them. So I would just play by myself. Um, and I remember, I don't know, when I was like in grade two, my dad took me to the Lake Louis Chateau for the um, ski racing downhill world cup. And I went into the rock store and I was like reading the different like things about the different rocks. And I saw like a worry stone, um, which is like, I think it's Chinese medicine, but it's like this smooth stone with like a thumb imprint in the middle. And when you pick it up and you like, you play with it, it's like, if your hands are busy, your mind's free. And I was like, oh, maybe that's what I need. Like, I need this. And like, I remember those thoughts distinctly and they're not neurotypical. It's like, I don't know, there's a lot of different things um, from growing up that just didn't really check out. Like I didn't really know how to socialize and interact with people. Um, I would study people. Like I studied all the popular girls and tried to like infiltrate that group. So I was like, oh, people like this group. Like this is who I need to be. So people don't bully me anymore, that they treat me better. And um, I studied like what they dressed, what they were into, the way that they did their hair and their makeup. And all of my effort, money and time went into replicating that. I've been practicing facial emotions in the mirror since I was 12. Um, I have like multiple different smiles that I've gone through. I've even like practiced walking in front of a camera to try and fix my gait and the way that I would walk. So like, I couldn't walk in a straight line to save my life. And I don't naturally swing my arms. I hold them crossing my chest or in my pockets or have to be holding something. And, um, my grandma used to make fun of me for doing that and would tell me I would fall on my face. And yeah, I don't know. Um, my childhood just didn't really make sense. And then high school was severely traumatic. Social skills, uh, were not there. And I was pushed past my ability to cope, um, which led me into being in a bunch of abusive relationships with men uh, cause I didn't understand consent. Nobody taught me how to say no or how to set boundaries or, and I didn't know how to tell what a healthy relationship was. And, um, then I started traveling the world cause it was easier to move from one place to the other and copy someone new than it was to form relationships. Um, and when I was away in New Zealand for the first time, um, I figured out that I had PTSD. So I've been trying to figure out like what's wrong with me not what's wrong with me, but like why things are harder for me my whole life. And I went through like that classic pixie manic dream girl phase that so many of us go through and like the hippie phase and the self-help phase. And like, I've read so many books. I'm like, oh, I just need to be spiritual. Oh, I'm like an empath. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like I can sense and feel things that other people can't. It's like, now nah, you're just fucking autistic. And you'd like, you have like extreme sensory sensitivities. Like that's why you feel things so differently. <laughs> and I was mm -hmm. just like, <laughs> but I, um, 
went through all that stuff and then realized I had PTSD because I, um, getting into new relationships. I, for the first time I was dating this really healthy guy. Um, and during the breakup, I had all of these feelings come up. I didn't know what they were. And I was reacting irrationally and I would react to having like sex with people. And I just, I was like, Oh, I need to go to therapy. And so then started going to therapy when I started university and I, um, I got diagnosed with complex PTSD and generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was in, I think my dad says they thought I had ADHD in like grade two, but they were against medication and my dad didn't believe in ADHD at the time. Um, and so like I went and got medication and saw a doctor when I was 16 because I was legally allowed to without my parents. Um, but yeah, like the PTSD, the anxiety, like when my triggers started to lessen and I started to process some of the trauma, it didn't really answer everything. And then the autistic traits started to seep forward. And, um, I got pushed past my ability to cope beyond anything I'd ever experienced when the pandemic happened. Um, the amount of change and disruption to my life and experiencing loss for the first time when my grandma died, my other grandma almost died. And I got into a relationship for the first time in my life, that's healthy. We're still dating. We're on year three, which is crazy. And, um, <laughs> just like moving a lot and trying to like live somewhere consistently and have relationships. And I just like, I entered a severe state of burnout where I couldn't take care of myself. Um, I had to take I grades, like incomplete grades in all of my classes in my final semester of school. I had to, um, quit my job. I couldn't feed myself. I couldn't shower. I couldn't work. Um, if anything went wrong, like if I was like cutting food and I like dropped something on the floor, if like I spilled something, cause I, I run out of coordination. That's what I call it. When I get overwhelmed, like it would cause an instant meltdown. And I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't exist. It was so hard. And I went to see my doctor and she was like, Oh, you're depressed. Like, we'll send, give you like antidepressants. And I was like, I don't think I'm depressed. Like I've read about depression and like, this isn't depression. I don't, this isn't that it was like an inability to, to function. And then I got onto TikTok before I made my account primarily about my autistic journey. And I started to see, um, content from creators like you. And I was just like, no, like, there's no way I'm autistic. Like, there's no way. Cause the only thing I knew about autism was stereotypes in the media. And I had very internalized ableism about myself. And I, um, then started to research it more and found out that there's a high number of autistic, uh, like AFAB people that have experiences with sexual assault and practicing facial emotions and how they mask and what they do. And I was just like, oh my fucking God. I was like, <laughs> is this it? And I remember I spent like 10 hours researching, like went so deep on it one day. And my roommate came home at the time and I looked at her and I was like, do you think I could be autistic? She was like, oh my fucking God, yes. She was like, why didn't I see it? That's it. That's it. And I was just like, oh no. And then I'm like, not oh no, but I was just like, oh my God. And then it was just this this spiral of like researching and unpacking and like the classic, like, you know, ebb and flow of like, oh, I'm autistic. It's like, there's no way I could be autistic. It's like, maybe I'm autistic. And then you get to the point where you're like, I'm autistic as fuck. <laughs> it just, everything makes sense. And in like the year before getting my formal diagnosis, um, continuing to like research and unmask and testing accommodations that I've never given myself before that I didn't know could help. Like my anxiety is lower. Um, I actually have healthy relationships for the first time in my life because I feel like they know me and not the mask. Um, there's just, I have a job where I'm openly, uh, able to communicate if I'm having a meltdown or if I, I can't cope, they don't judge me for the way that I communicate. Um, I've gotten yelled at in previous jobs for the way that I communicate. And I didn't understand why. And it was like, I just... I've never had this level of like understanding or space to show up as I am. And it's daunting to still try to figure everything else out. Cause there's not a lot of supports for autistic adults, but at the same time, it's just like, I actually like who I am for the first time in my life. Cause I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. So that's kind of how late diagnosis feels and late self-discovery feels when you find out you're on the spectrum after 28 years of abuse. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your candor. There's so many things in there that I, that I relate to, obviously being a um, 
a feminine presenting woman myself being late diagnosed. I wasn't diagnosed or self. I'm still self-diagnosed. I haven't gotten a formal diagnosis. And um, I've I've ebbed and flowed. I've gone back and forth with whether or not I'm going to get a formal diagnosis. I'm more than not for me right now because it just doesn't make sense for my life. Um, And I actually kind of wanted to circle back around to that because you brought up a point that you feel like you were able to talk about your journey a little bit more before you receive the formal diagnosis. And I just wanted to ask, like, do you think that that could have anything to do with like, have like a validation, like it, without having the formal diagnosis, people connecting with your story could have been a form of like needed validation to like know that you're not alone. But like now that you have the formal diagnosis, I don't know, do you feel like maybe there's like no longer a need to maybe like reaffirm so much because you have that affirmation? I don't know. Um, That's a good question. I, to be honest, the like, the time that I got my diagnosis was right before Christmas. Um, okay. So I finished my last like interview. So it was four interviews um, and I did a bunch of other tests. And then unfortunately I wasn't able to get like the final appointment with the doctor where she would go over the results and tell me like, um, like over the report and look at like what level of support I need and the different criteria and all that kind of stuff until after new year's. And then like, going into Christmas, I have so much anxiety around Christmas and my job and my boyfriend was on a two week trip and I always get a little bit disrupted when he's gone because he's such like a huge part of my daily routine now. And I just like, and then all the feelings, like my last appointment with her, she was like, you're really good at self-diagnosing yourself. And I was like, yep, that's the pattern recognition. And she was like, but you know, neurotypical people don't really research autism for a year. I was like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) so, um, yeah, I don't know. I honestly, the, I had like, went into kind of like burnout again through the holidays, like couldn't really leave the house, couldn't really take care of myself, had multiple mm-hmm. meltdowns, um, was trying to work through there. Like the thought of going to Christmas with my family who sees me in one way and then having to educate them on treating me another way. It's like, they've been questioning whether or not I was autistic, even when I did come out to them as self-diagnosed. Um, so it's just like, just the overwhelm of processing that and that people are still going to doubt it Mm -hmm. and that they need to be re-educated in how to treat me, how to support me and how to view me for the rest of my life after 28 years. Um, And that I can't get them to pick up a book or to read an article or to listen to a podcast. And um, just the overwhelm with that I guess I don't know why I'm having a harder time talking about it. I guess I feel angry that it's my job to educate them when it feels like it's been my job to show up my entire life and nobody else has met me 50, 50. Um, so before that it was just like, Oh, this is like a new thing. Like I'm passionate about it and I want to learn more about it. And I'm learning about myself, but then with the clinical diagnosis, it's kind of like, and honestly, honestly, it feels like, fuck you. Like I'm, I'm done extending myself for other people. I don't want to educate them. I don't want to take my energy and my time to try and have hard conversations and have them doubt me and question what I need. It's like, I want them to take the initiative to learn about it. Um, so I think it's just pure anger. It's just the validation I think has impacted it, but I've also been too busy with work to sit down and like fully process it. But it's, uh, I don't know. Does that kind of make sense? No, it makes complete sense. And I feel like that's a, a totally valid way to feel. Um, I It's weird because when you were saying that, it was it was kind of reminding me about like some of the things that I'm going through right now and part of the reason why I quit my job. Um, so I went into extreme burnout in September. Like I literally could not go to work. Like the idea of going into the office and the amount of energy that it took to mask all day and be in that environment, I just couldn't. But I knew I could still do my job. So I just wanted to work from home that day um, because we did, we did have like a flexible schedule where it was like two days out of the week, we worked from home, three days out of the week in the office. But I kind of wanted an extra work from home day. And previously I had reached out to my manager and disclosed to her that I am autistic. 
and you know let her know that like hey working in the office is very overwhelming to me and I'm actually going to be looking into seeing if maybe I could just like you know work from home because like work from home all five days because I get more work done there I can control my environment I don't have these extraneous um you know, conversations and noises and people constantly coming up to me and interrupting me while I'm like trying to do a task and like all these things. And I explained all of this and I got this sense that like they were, they were going to understand if I needed a day or two to like work from home. But the very first time I tried to do that, I got hit with like, no, you can't have any extra time. You, if you work from home today, you got to swap it for one of your other work from home days and that like literally sent me over the edge and I flipped out and I literally just called out for the rest of the day I was like you know what well you know what I'm just gonna use a sick day today then and then the next day I woke up and I couldn't get out of bed and I just used another sick day and at that point I was like you know what I need time I need actual time Fast forward, I um, decided to go on FMLA because they were not, you know, at all willing to work with me, like, without any kind of formal diagnosis. And um, so I was like, all right, well, let me try to work on it. That was the only reason why I started to pursue a formal diagnosis. Um, But long story short, I got diagnosed with ADHD, generalized anxiety disorder, and got referred to a neuropsychologist or psychiatrist to get a autism assessment because the the person who assessed me is not a neuropsychiatrist. She's a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So she really strongly believes that I should work from home. So she filled out my ADA paperwork saying that the accommodation that I should have is to work from home. But before I could send it in, I get a very threatening email from my job saying that we're, you know, your short term disability claim was denied. And the only thing that you can use is the ADA and the accommodation is more time off. So they were trying to tell me they were trying to force me into a corner that I had to go through the ADA and that I couldn't use the short-term disability policy that I paid for as part of my benefits. And then they tried to dictate to me that your only accommodation is going to be more time off. When I never wanted time off in the first place, that's all they would do for me. And so I didn't even tell them that actually I now have the paperwork that could force you to make me work from home or I'd sue you for not complying with the ADA. Instead, I quit because I was like, if I have to go through all of this after working here for damn near six years, um, just to, and this is the first time I've ever asked you for anything. I've been a model employee, worked there six years, had five positions. Um, like, you know, never asked for anything was like the model team player and just to realize how much I had to go through just for them to not believe me and not care. I was like, I'm not even going to stay, even though I, I, why, why would I want to stay somewhere when I have to force you to believe and give me the accommodation that would really just like keep me sane, happy and healthy and the productive employee that you loved quote unquote for five and a half years. I feel that deeply, like deeply. It's like they them doing that is just like they don't value you the fact that you work there for six years also my personal feelings about asking to work from home after the pandemic and if an employer says no it's like shut I swear a lot shut the fuck up like you literally <laughs> did this when there was a crisis you know that we can be productive like you do not need to come into the office yeah my theory is, um, and I, I have like really no love, there's no real love left for corporate America at all. Um, but my my theory is because of the hierarchical system, people who like place their value in their job title, um, they're usually the people who get those higher up positions, right? And they don't really have much value outside of the workplace. That's their whole thing, right? you can't have the workplace culture from home. There's no small talk. There's no kissing the boss's ass from home. There's no validating you, treating you like you're a celebrity when you're walking the halls from home. So we got to make sure that everyone's in the office so that they can play their role so that I can walk in and be the king or the queen of the jungle. A hundred percent. I think that like small talk for neurotypical people, like it's honestly just a... It's to infer like your hierarchical status in a capitalistic society and like where you stand and how people should treat you. That's basically what it comes down to. And it's like, 
as autistic people, we don't give a shit about that. Like, I don't, I will treat you the same if you are the CEO of the biggest company in the world, or if you're just like some person I just met on a bus, like I really don't care. And that's gotten me in trouble in previous jobs without realizing that was why that was happening. But I have no respect for authority. I don't care (laughs) about institutions. I think that they're, I don't like, and I've been like that my whole life. I was a nightmare for my mother when I was like, I think I might have be on the like have a PDA profile to be honest. Um, mm-hmm. Makes sense. Uh, I was reading through the PDA profile like diagnostic criteria with my partner, and he was like, "That that you <laughs> people can't see the face that I just made, but his like eyebrows went up and his eyes like got super wide, and he was just like, yeah, okay, I have like twenty examples that fit all of these.'" <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, okay. checks out but yeah the the hierarchical structure I don't I don't understand like um I don't know I when I tell people stories about my current job about like I pitched a like a digital ecosystem and website redesign strategy to the CEO and in it she like cut me off in the middle and was like well no no we're doing fine with that I was like respectfully you're not I was like Ooh. you guys have never tracked analytics like you, you're making assumptions and that's a poor business decision. And I told people that outside of that meeting, they're like, you said what to the CEO? And I was like, what? It's the truth. So I was like, what do you yeah. mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand. I can't, my last job, I would, the one that I had to quit, I um, was an intern at an engineering firm. And I would call my boyfriend crying every, after every meeting and after every work day, because I would, there was conflict when I didn't think there should be conflict. And that was before I knew I was autistic. And it was just like saying the wrong thing to the wrong person, but not realizing it's the wrong thing because you're communicating directly and literally, and you don't understand the nuances of corporate yes. communication. And it's just like, yeah, I I got like full on yelled at by my, my colleague right before I quit um, to the point that he went to HR and refused to talk to me after until wow. I, my job ended. And it was like, that was right after I went to HR and I told them that I was seeking an autism diagnosis and I was struggling severely and I needed accommodations. And my first day unmasking on the job, I got yelled at. Oh, that is terrible. I am so sorry that happened to you. Like that, I swear I relate to that so deeply because like what for me started me understanding how differently I am was being in a traditionally corporate environment and getting this reputation of being a stuck up standoffish bitch when all I did was sit there and help people and like I would wear my earphones at my desk so like I did not participate in the small talk because I didn't understand what the small talk was for it was just nonsensical and I did not care what these people were talking about if you needed something that I could help you with by all means come and talk to me but what what happened is like I um and I loved when you talked on like you were you went to the whole manic pixie dream girl like phase because I did too and I now crystals tarot cards I moved to Tofino BC like I was like I was in a deep like deep (laughs) so exactly but so am I so I bring that up because like I do I understand what being an empath is it's just being highly attuned to other people's emotion and it's usually a trauma response because I had to understand stand and read the room a lot as a child being a people pleaser and a fawner so um but but I could feel that people didn't like me even though they wouldn't say it directly and they were being very passive aggressive or nice nasty and so because I'm very literal at first I thought people were okay I didn't think that anything was wrong but then I started to really like connect the dots and see the patterns and I'm like yo why do people keep treating me like a piece of shit when I am literally just helping people and then I was like, oh, it's because I am not talking to them. But not, but even when I realized that, I was like, I can't force myself to be a part of a conversation that I don't give two shits about. I don't care what you guys are talking about because all you're talking about is other people or complaining about your job. And I'm just like, neither one of those are productive conversations and they don't interest me in any kind of way. But like I was working, I reported directly to the vice president of a department, like one of the biggest departments in the company. And when I took the role, the role was called the support specialist role. And I thought I would just be there to support and like be a help. 
But I learned quickly that it was more so to be, to learn the players and to be in the meetings and to go to the cocktail parties and the and the happy hour and to go to lunch. And I was like, I didn't come here for that. So when I got invited to things, when I first came over, if I didn't have a genuine interest, I wouldn't go. <laughs> and then I think that, and I, I wound up deconstructing and realized, oh, okay, so this is where it started. My bad reputation started from the beginning because I was just honest and thinking that people were just giving these genuine invitations as opposed to playing the game and like inviting me out so that they can suss me out and like, you know, see where they should place me in the hierarchy and how they should treat me and all that bullshit. The frenemy thing has fucked me up my whole life. Like every girl relationship I've had, I didn't experience a real female friendship until I was 24 years old. Every other one was manipulative. It was like, keep them closer. And like something about, I studied how to be the pretty girl. Like I studied how to be typical Westernized beauty standards. And I still wear that mask. Um, but at the same time, I'm more comfortable being a gremlin. Like I would say that <laughs> the way that I look is definitely feminine, but the way that I prefer to dress is often more masculine. My body language is masculine. Like I remember during my hippie manic dream girl phase, this like Ish, his name was Ishmael. He's lovely. And he's from Australia. He was living and working uh, in Tofino when I lived there with his girlfriend, Ellen. He was like, Tori, you have like like feminine, masculine and childlike energy. Like it's really cool. And I was like, oh no, that's just autistic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And like, I like, yeah, I, um, the frenemy thing. I just like the, these girls would like, I've always, I have an impressive resume of things that I'm good at, like, um, athleticism, skiing. I'm a musician. Like I made jewelry and sold it at markets. Like I, I always figured out what was the cool thing to be doing in the new place that I lived. And I would master that. It was part of my mask and I was mm. good at it because it was like, I think it was like a, a percentage of people on the spectrum, especially like AFAB people tend to have special interests in people. So I studied people and like, I got really good at it. So people be like, oh, a cool new girl. Like she's pretty, she dresses this way, she fits in. But then like they wanted the mask or they wanted what I was good at on paper, the way that I presented, but they didn't actually like who I was as a person. Yeah. And so they would manipulate me and use me and like steal from me, get personal information from me. Cause I don't know what I should share and what I shouldn't share with different degrees of friendship or interactions and tell other people that and sleep with my boyfriend or like, just like a long list of things that really validated that I am difficult to love and I am difficult to be with. So the frenemy thing is very fucking real. Um, what changed, like, it's funny. You said like the, this being awareness and like being an empath when, um, I did the, what is it? It's the social responsiveness scale was one of the tests I did for my uh -huh. the SRS too. Um, and it's interesting because like my boyfriend fills out the same questions and then I fill them out and his, the answers are pretty much the exact same. Mine were more severe than his, but I still passed the threshold. Um, but it was interesting because I actually am less disabled in my, my social awareness, but where I have uh, lower skills is actually in the cognitive ability to assess a situation and understand what to do and then to figure out how to communicate. So that mm -hmm. takes like massive cognitive effort for me. But studying and watching people is something that I have learned how to do through like reading books and uh, studying psychology and like marketing, understanding like behavior and mm -hmm. how the neurotypical brain works because it's actually like neurotypicals are not all that it makes me so mad because they think they're all these unique individuals, but they're really not. And they don't not understand how the environment and like associations and myelinating pathways in your brain creates these behavioral responses and ideologies, biases, like perspectives, like personality traits, like, like the whole like fanaticism of language and how that implements like culture. And like, they don't understand that they're not that fucking unique and they're not that fucking special. Like, <laughs> And I just, I needed to understand why everything was so hard. So I studied people, but then I didn't have the same social awareness when I was a kid. It changed as I got older. So into like teenage years, when I actually started caring about socializing, because I really wanted to fit in and into like adulthood when I started to study it academically. But when I was a kid, it was the same thing. Like, like I, I have distinct memories of like going up to people and trying to have conversations and they would just stare at me. 
or everybody would laugh. And it's like, I didn't know how to enter a conversation. I didn't know how to carry a conversation. I didn't know how to have like a reciprocal conversation where I'd ask appropriate questions. I would just say what I thought I should say. And I remember like, as I was trying to infiltrate the popular girls, like we were smoking shisha, man, addiction and substance abuse. And like, I mean, get into that with autism. I was that kid. Um, (laughs) Self-medicating. To the T. Um, but the, the like popular group, we were sitting and smoking shisha in my friend's basement and they were all talking about girls at the school and like what they wore and like all of this drama. And I was sitting there and I was inside full anxiety, full panic. So I was trying to like, listen to all the parts of the conversation, figure out what I should say. And then I finally figured out what I should say. And I said it and it was dead quiet. And I was so embarrassed and I went to the bathroom and I just started pulling my hair and I was like having a full meltdown because I just said the wrong thing. And I just (laughs) like studying people like now as an adult, um, the jobs that I've had have taught me how to have the right body language, facial expressions, tone and language to impress people with networking. But when it comes Mm -hmm. to like socializing casually, I'm not very good at that. So like my boyfriend noticed that when we first started dating, anytime he'd introduce me to a new person, I would tell the same stories and the same jokes, like scripted to the T. And I didn't even realize I was doing that. And I would never ask them questions about who they were or what they did. And the Mm. first time he took me to meet his parents, he was just like, okay, maybe she's not interested in my family. Like doesn't really care. Cause I like, she didn't ask my parents a single question and just talked about herself the whole time. (laughs) Um, (laughs) which is funny. But then like, if you put me in like, um, Yeah, I went to this like athletes excellence dinner where I got to meet all the athletes at work and like their families and stuff. And Mm -hmm. I showed up and apparently like the VP of marketing and everybody complimented me because they were like, Tori works the room. And it was like, yes, but it's a persona. It's like, I put it on. It's like a performance. It's like, I know how to be charming. I know how to be like, like, I know how to do it. And it's, Mm -hmm. but it's exhausting. Like I go home afterwards and like, I can't get out of bed for two days, but it's like, so like people relatable. love the charismatic performance mask and I'm so fucking good at it. But then when that ends, there's no ability to form relationships or maintain them or like, you know, the cognitive ability to be like, oh, this is what I should do. And this is what I should say to like respond to these people's feelings or like, I need to treat this text message differently to this text message. Cause this person is like different in like my social structure of like what a friend is. And I didn't actually learn what a fucking friend was until last year. <laughs> I, I was very confused. My therapist had to draw this circle diagram and I was like, oh my God. And I've, I've never been invited to a wedding. I've like, you know, like there's so much there. So like I had to learn I had to learn how to respond to people. Um, That's exhausting though. That's incredibly exhausting because um, I feel like the only reason why we need to do that is because every, most people take things so personally, like they read into your behavior, what they want to read into it, as opposed to just taking it at face value. And if everyone approached things at face value, kind of like, you know, if we if we could rely on direct communication and people's actions just matching their intentions, like how I feel like it is a lot of the times when I'm speaking and interacting with other autistic people, then we wouldn't have to mask because we wouldn't have to adapt to different people's interpretations of us. And like that's that's part of the reason why it became increasingly harder for me to work in a in an environment that I had thrived in. Like, I mean, thrived in that environment for five years. But once I could no longer mask and I started losing my ability to like mask on cons- on a consistent basis, that's yeah, when I can tell that people away didn't. From you. Hell yeah. And that's when I can tell that people just didn't actually like me because they were like, you're not yourself. And I'm like, but, and then I'm like, I'm actually more myself than I've ever been in my life. But they're like, well, you know, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing's wrong. What's wrong is you like trying to get me to perform for you. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not gonna, I have, this has been like my new, I don't do like New Year's like resolutions or anything like that, but this has kind of been like my mantra. Um, I only have one life. There's no do-overs, right? So I'm not gonna continue to live a life where I have to perform it for other people. And that's Preach. what masking is. And it's like, if you don't like me as I am, then you're not for me. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with losing 
or, you know, losing relationships or having to walk away from even people that I might have been friends with for 30 years or whatnot, if it means that I am able to be my authentic self and be comfortable in my skin and feel like I'm thriving and not like fighting to try to survive. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I like um, to to add to that. Well, actually, what you said about like if people just communicated literally, I wanted to share a positive story about my work wife. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I came into this job and like the reason I went viral on TikTok actually is because I shared a meltdown that I had after the interview for this job, my first interview, Um, because I didn't know when to tell them I was autistic after my last experience telling HR and getting yelled at and having to quit my job. It was just like, when do I tell them? Like, am I safe to tell them? Like, do I even tell them right now? Like, I don't have a clinical diagnosis. Like, how do I, what do I do with this? And then um, in the interview with the HR manager, after my first one, I told her I was autistic after like nailing the interview and um, like info dumping about marketing, like the results I've had, like contracting projects. And um, she was like, oh, my like best friend just found out she was autistic and she's like 42 years old. And I was like, oh, dreams. I was like, so <laughs> there was no problem with it. And like coming into work, I was like, this is how I communicate, like, and I'm recovering from burnout. So if I, like, I don't have the ability to mask. And if I don't have to mask at work, then I have more energy to do my job well. And like a lot of people's brains can't do what my brain does with like, um, what did the, the doctor that diagnosed me called me a data junkie. And I am a data junkie. I love research. I love analyzing patterns and like my attention to details. Like, you know, like I get compliments from higher ups at work all the time that I've taught them a lot about attention to detail and strategic thinking and growth, because that's like, I, but that's also very autistic. It's like Uh bottom up thinking, having to understand the why before you can make a decision, but that's like the best way to conduct business. And it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, so coming into this job, like there's a lot of things, like I asked them if um, they've ever done an anonymous survey with athletes to figure out how they feel about our social media and like how we're representing them and like speaking to our fans and stuff like that. And they're like, no, we haven't. I was like, what? I was like, why? (laughs) I was so many whys. I was like, why? That's dumb. Why? That's stupid. And they were like, it is stupid. I was like, I'm glad you're responding that way rather than getting upset with me. Like saying that the way you guys do stuff is dumb. Um, But yeah, I like explaining like how like neurotypical people cannot actually separate logic like logic reasoning and emotional reasoning thing. They're Thank tied in for, together. Yes. And in marketing, um, we try to figure out how to position a brand to emotionally resonate with a group. So that means um, it's the highest level of like resonance that impacts behavior and loyalty and the likelihood mm-hmm. that they will purchase. So that's like identity marketing, like values marketing, like emotional marketing, like all that kind of stuff. And that's woven into like the archetype and the personality and the architecture of a brand. And then it's like filtered out through communications. But for neurotypical people, the way that you frame information, so like the different es- esocentric forms of like design, the music choice, the typeface that you use, even like the channels that you presented on the tone, like everything, uh, different design elements, uh, the way that you communicate emotion through those and you transcribe it through those is more important than the information itself. And you can see that in the digital, like, uh, in the digital space and throughout the technological revolution, seeing all these like micro kind of like cultish groups pop up during a crisis, mm-hmm. because the way that information is framed is more important than the accuracy of the information. And there's a lot Absolutely. of academic studies that look at how the way that you frame information can change somebody's decision or behavior rather than the information on its own. Um, so it's like, you know, educating them on these things at work and explaining it to them. Like my, my work wife is now just like, you know, when she starts to emotionally react to information or like data that we get, because she used to like get really upset when we'd get negative feedback from athletes. And then I taught her to be like, no, it's just data. It's Mm -hmm. just information. It doesn't have deeper meaning. It's just information. It doesn't mean you're bad at your job. It doesn't mean like, and now she's like, if she has a moment where she emotionally reacts to them, she's like, oh, Jade, stop being so neurotypical. It's very (laughs) cute. It's like, (laughs) 
That's adorable. Well, firstly, I think it's amazing. And you're extremely lucky to be able to be in an environment like that where you can be direct and also ask why. Because I'm sure you know that question, that one little three-letter word can literally send people off the fucking deep end. Like, I've gotten in trouble so many times in my life by asking why. Because I definitely have a PDA profile. I can't do something sometimes if I don't understand why. Like, oh, yeah. even if I don't want to do something, like... I I have a quick antidote. My favorite boss ever, favorite boss ever, was such a direct communicator. This is why me and her got along so freaking well. And this is before I realized I was autistic. I started unpacking this later. I was like, why didn't me and Gretchen get along so so well? And then I realized it's because we didn't sugarcoat shit when we talked to each other for the most part. And um, oh my God, I just had a brain fart and I lost my train of thought. Dang it to Frick. Hold on, I was going back. Oh, I hate when that happens. Oh, can I go? Can I go grab my water bottle while you find the thought? Yes, please. Okay. Do. Okay. And I'm take a sip of water. I know there's a reason why I bought it. I hate it when that happens. Sometimes uh, I just like go blank, and it's just like everything's gone. Okay, <laughs> one sec. No worries. Okay. And, okay. So yes. I, thank you. I got. I got the thought back. Um. So I remember there was one time where um she was telling me that there was like a change in process for something that we had to do, and for me, I just didn't really understand like why we we had to do it. And I was like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, why do we have to do this? And she just didn't take offense to it. She just explained to me why. And even though I didn't necessarily agree with it, I was like, okay, well now that I understand why, I can at least do it because I get the logic behind it and it was a stark contrast between her my manager and my supervisor at the time who was very much a worrier and a micromanager whenever I would ask her why like she would like tell me to do something and not give me any like reasoning behind it and then she would take my why as a questioning her authority like one time she straight up was like well you know what everyone else knows how to do this and if you have a problem with it I guess you should ask your manager and I was just like I literally only just asked why you're telling me to do it this way because we've never done it this way. okay I guess we're in a fight and um, I have yeah. like 10 stories exactly <laughs> like that like or like I get the like well I've been doing this for 60 years or like I've been doing this for this and I'm just like so I mean, you know the like, best way to do it <laughs> no if anything that probably means you're outdated on current research and like you know the study of this practice or how to do it best like I it's like why is the amount of time that you've done something relevant like of course you're going to have like learnings but the market is shifting especially dependent on like the industry that you're in and like the job that you have like Mm -hmm. uh, marketing, for example, is like, it's completely dependent on what's happening with technology. Like in the last 10 years, everything has changed with what everybody knows about marketing and consumer behavior is completely different following the pandemic as well. So it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> having, having an environment where like my unique skills are valued is it's like, my job is absolutely exhausting. Um, but it's also like, I don't, I don't want to leave because I've never been this accepted or like appreciated at a job before to show mm -hmm. up as like my autistic self or like, you know, to say like sassy blunt things and it's okay. And everybody laughs and it's like, not <laughs> that big of a deal. And it's like, I don't know. It's, it is like very important, but I, I also think it was the perfect storm because there it's a nonprofit organization that manages like our Canadian ski teams. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm working in like sport marketing and like sport media basically but because it's a nonprofit and like uh with like their capacity issues they've never had somebody come in and ask why they've always just like kind of had this survival strategy of just like slap chopping stuff together and putting it out because they don't have the time to ask why they don't have time to do data analytics they've never had a strategy so coming in it's like they're like oh yeah these are like our temp pool moments for like content i was like why and they were like well, we just thought they'd be cool. And I was like, for who? And I was like, so you did them last year? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, how'd they perform? And they were like, well, I don't know. And I was like, so why do you think we should do them again? And they were just like, that's a good point, actually. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> it was just like, that is such a perfect example of why we need to question things and like the difference between, um, 
neurotypicals and and autistic people like like it's not you don't even have to have the pda profile it's the difference between being led by emotion and being led by logic and i always feel like we get this um misconception of being like emotionless and cold because we're not run a lot of, and I don't want to talk about us like we're a monolith, but overall, like a lot of us aren't run by our emotions. We're very logical. So if it makes sense, even if we don't like it, a lot of the times we can still like adjust to it. Um, and if you can make it make sense for us, so you can put, answer the why behind the what, it just, it, it makes sense, right? And so for me, I've always been someone who hasn't really emotionally reacted if I could understand what's going on, if that makes sense. So like, if I understand that you're trying to manipulate me, I'm not going to give you the reaction that you're looking for because that would be unintentional. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, it would be like me forcing it to perform for you. But then that that um, tendency of mine got me a reputation of being like, well, you don't care. Or I can't read you. Well, you can't read me. Be- you can't read me actually translates to you can't manipulate me because I'm a very logical and discerning person. And if I catch what you're doing, you're just, I'm just going to be like, okay, I get it. Like, I don't know. And it's just like, I feel like because they're like, they want that emotional reaction and they don't care if it's illogical what they do to get that emotional reaction. And then when they don't get it, it's like, oh, well, I guess I'm talking to a brick wall or, you're not, I don't know. It, it, at least that's been my experience. A hundred percent. And one of my biggest challenges is responding appropriately uh, to an emotional response. So it's like, you know, like uh, my little sister, for example, before we found out I was autistic, um, we got into so many fights. I remember throughout our entire lives where she would be like, you're so selfish, you're a narcissist, like all you care about is yourself. And um, when I was found out I was autistic and understood like the different types of empathy and like analyzing like the way that I show empathy and maybe where like I struggle with some of those aspects of like communication and relationship forming and like all that kind of stuff. I called her, told her like I could be autistic and I found out all this interesting stuff about like the way that we, we process those cues and like communicating is different. And I was like, when you called me a narcissist and selfish, were you trying to tell me that you felt I was unempathetic towards you? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, then why didn't you just say that? I was like, why <laughs> right. could, like, I like when she called me a narcissist, I like went and Googled and like researched the diagnostic criteria and like watched like, ho- like hours and hours of stuff trying to figure it out. I was like, I don't think I'm a narcissist. Like, I don't understand what's going on. But it was like, you know, like understanding that. And now she knows that um, the way that I respond to emotional reactions from people is just different. It's not bad. Yeah. Um And that's the biggest thing. And it's like, I, there's a lot of times like when my best friend would call me crying and it's like, I know that I don't, I can feel that I'm not responding the way that I should. And in a corporate setting, holy fuck, that makes the situation so much worse. Like somebody's upset with you for something. And like, I start to panic because I'm like, how do I, how do I smooth over this situation? Like, how do I make this situation better? And the way that I communicate and my nervousness comes through and then like, mm-hmm. I'll say the wrong thing and I'll try to like backtrack it. And then they get even more upset. And I'm just like, how do I, and especially when they're upset about something that I didn't intentionally do, it's like, I've never had like malice or like the intent to hurt or the like anything like that in my entire life. I don't understand that. It like made me severely depressed when I was 18 years old because I started learning about how fucked up the world is. And I was like, how Mm. can a group just treat another group like this? Like, I just don't, I don't understand. And I am, yeah. So not being able to respond to neurotypical emotional processing of information and every aspect of human interaction is information. Mm -hmm. It's like everything, like from like, you know, the lack of like, I'm either super emotive or there's nothing. And if I'm transitioning from one task to another or one environment to another, it's complete shutdown. It's like a lot for me to process. And I know that like my boyfriend has a hard time because like if I'm like working and I'm doing like a repetitive task or like I'm inputting data and then like we have to transition to go to a family dinner, I'll be like completely quiet. There's no emotion. I look like I'm upset or I look like I'm angry. And like in the past, people have been like, what's wrong? Like, are you okay? And then I would have to, I was like, oh, something's wrong. I have to figure out what's wrong. And I start going through everything and like verbal dumping, trying to like figure out what is it like, maybe it's this, or maybe like, I feel this way about this, but then like, 
you know, like I stepped back and we got to the dinner that we were at and I've, I've been unmasking around his family more and I'm, I'm getting like really comfortable around them. And I was like, I went to the bathroom and I like bathrooms are safe places. Just gotta Mm -hmm. say that. Um, and I just like checked in with myself and I was like, Oh, nothing's wrong. I'm just transitioning. And like, I haven't left this space and this task to be in this space and task. And like, I'm just it takes me a while to like change to get there and to like, yeah, but it's interesting. Like emotions come through in nonverbal body language and like facial expressions and your tone of voice and your cadence. And, um, it really upsets neurotypical people when you don't respond how they expect you to, or how another yes. neurotypical person would. And that's something that this psychologist, um, or sorry, this like, neuropsych that diagnosed me is, uh, wants me to focus on is like, it's not like weird behavior or different. It's just unexpected. Yeah. I call that when we go off script, because I feel like neurotypical people definitely live their lives based off of a script and they don't, obviously they're not cognizant of it because like you touched on earlier, a lot of them feel like they're individuals, but they don't even realize how much they stick to a pattern. Like their behavior is very, very predictable. Like, like you said, it's, it's data. So it's kind of like the choose your own adventure books. If you go here, it's going to lead here. But if they do this, it's going to lead there. And very, very seldomly do they go off script. And we usually aren't even aware of the script. And so a lot of things that we do or say are odd to them because they're not expecting it. And so that brain power that it takes to for us to like cognitively do what they do unconsciously is so draining and to me I find it so unnecessary so like the more I learned about what masking was and the more I unpacked like what they were expecting the less I wanted to do it and maybe again that's the PDA thing it's like well they're expecting it so I'm not going to do it but it's also because it doesn't make logic sense a lot of the things that they do and when you ask why okay so now that I understand why you're doing this I don't care like I don't care. Like you're what you're doing doesn't make any sense. So even though I get what you're trying to do, I'm not going to give you the emotional reaction that you're looking for. You're going to have to be direct if you want it, because I'm not going to like reward you for your shitty passive aggressive behavior. You know what yeah, I mean? I do. But I like, I also still, um, I have a fawning response still. Um, like a trauma response that I'm, I am working really hard to process because now it's like, I don't know, like my, my boyfriend and I got into a bit of a fight the other night about like initiating intimacy and like, like I have some examples I gave in my diagnosis. I remember this time, like I, a boy invited me over to his house and I really wanted to like, you know, kiss him and like hook up with him. And I like was on the couch with him and we were cuddling and I just started like touching my neck because I thought like, oh, that'll show that I want intimacy I was like this is how I like initiate and he was like why are you touching your neck and I was just like (laughs) I was just like oh my god or like I remember like like movies taught me that love at first sight is a thing and it's like you know like I thought that if I like became friends with the boy that I wanted to date um I also think my interest in boys was masking I actually am bisexual and I feel like that was taken away from me Mm -hmm. um But I was like, oh, okay. I just have to like dress similar, be interested in the same things. And if I stand close enough or in similar proximity or do the same activities, he'll notice me and we'll start dating. It did not work. I got a serious like trademark of being freaking creepy. Like I just, (laughs) um, yeah. So initiating is not the same. And like, he's like, I always try to initiate. And I was like, but what is initiation? Like, what does that mean? Like, how could I initiate? He's like, well, you could just ask me. I was like, but you don't just ask me. So it's like, what is your form of initiation? Because the communication is so different. It's so different. And like, you know, like he was like, well, I have troubles with this and this and this. And like everything that he listed has to do with me being autistic. It has to do with my energy levels. And like, I get overwhelmed and I get into a hole. And then it's like, I don't want to be touched. I don't want Mm -hmm. to be intimate being intimate is the last thing on my place. I don't want to socialize. I can hardly leave the house. I can't shower. Like I'll go for like five days without showering. Showering's overwhelming. And it's like one of my biggest 
um, hesitations and like anxiety inducing things about moving in with him was like, I've never lived with somebody where they've seen that. That's something I've hid my entire life. So it's like who I am out in public is like a put together, ambitious, motivated athlete or like musician or like any of the things that I do, like I'm outward facing, I'm social, I'm a go-getter. But when I get home, I can't take care of myself and I'm constantly having meltdowns and I'm analyzing every social situation in the shower. And like, I just, people don't see that. So for somebody to fully see that, to like fully see me and accept it, it's like, you know, it's, it's hard. And um, now that I know those things are the things that he's upset about are me being autistic. My previous self in dating relationships, when people get upset with me for things, I didn't even realize were a problem or like, mm -hmm. then my fawning response would come out and it's like, no, it's like sacrifice this need that I have, um, or like say something to like put their needs first. And that's where like that codependency comes out. So like, I'm really trying to, now that I understand I have that response and I've worked on it in therapy and learned how to set boundaries better and like really develop my self-worth. It's like, okay, how do I take that? And how do I apply it to an autistic lens? So like we were sitting there having this conversation and I was like, I'm kind of twofold here because like your feelings are valid, but at the same time, all the things that you're struggling with have to do with me being autistic. And I was like, I'm spending thousands of dollars getting a diagnosis, going to therapy, researching every waking minute and dissecting the way that I exist so I can figure out how to have some sense of stability and not try to have those peaks and troughs. Like what accommodations do I need so that I can stay regulated and I don't go through burnout and I don't get exhausted. And like, you know, how do I find balance? Cause I've never had somebody teach me how to do that. And I was like, the thing is, is that I'm not responsible for the way that you feel about those things. Like you're responsible for them. But these are lines yeah. I took from therapy, <laughs> but I was like, I, you're responsible for your feelings. And I was like, I'm putting in all this work so that I can show up more consistently. And I'm learning about myself so that I can try to maintain being regulated, but you need to put in work too. Yeah. You need to process your feelings about this. Like you need to like, you know, it can't just be on me. Cause it's, it's always on the disabled person. It's always on the disabled person to like, or like the marginalized person or the oppressed person to like shift and show up. It's not very often that those people have space created for them or that people process their feelings or their biases or like the, the connections and beliefs that they have about that person and what the behavior means. And it's always on the other person to show up and put in the work. And I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. There has to be that reciprocity. Absolutely. Which is I mean, hilarious because we suck at reciprocity, but it's like, <laughs> no, like I have logically have been burning myself out trying to make everybody else comfortable my whole life. And fawning has made me like completely lose my sense of like worth, identity, boundaries, and like, like just make me feel like I'm too difficult to be with. And I was like, I've been putting in all this work. Everybody else needs to put in some work because I am fucking tired. A men, a freaking men. Oh my goodness. This actually, our conversation took a turn that I didn't think it was going to take. I actually, I took a couple notes because I wanted to make sure that we touched on a few things really quickly. You actually brought up, because I, I, I say this as an interview because it's going to sound like I'm being a little schizophrenic and changing the topic. No, but I want to okay. touch on this before we do. Um, and it's actually still a part of masking. So you had said before that traveling was part of your mask. And that it was just easier to go from like place to place and like fit in and fit in. And that right there actually like struck a chord with me. I, um, so I do a lot of traveling by myself. I'm actually about to be traveling for the next couple of weeks by myself. And I get a lot of like people either being impressed by it, like, oh my God, like I can't believe that you'll do it or like feeling sad for me. Yeah, but I'm like, I like to do it by myself because I like to be in control of where I go and what I do. But also, it's a lot easier to just kind of like have I've always been good with um networking I should say where it's like you meet someone for a few minutes or even a couple of hours at a party or something like that but then you probably never see them again but you've made this amazing impression with them and they'll never forget you but you can't remember their name the next day type thing and when you were kind of talking that really reminded me of that and I wanted to kind of like hear a little bit more about your um 
your like why you consider traveling part of your mask because i i kind of i appreciate that phrasing it really like resonated with me yeah i mean um I guess to like, I have to give like a little bit of background for how I ended up traveling and moving around. Like I basically moved every four months to a year for seven years from place to place. And I was never in one place for a long time. And like, I grew up in a small town in Alberta for 17 years where I was like severely bullied. Like my, my high school boyfriend, um, who was actually a cocaine addict, but I didn't know about, um, and he was on steroids and I was 16 dated him for two years. Um, he ended up sleeping with my best friend for four months who was dating his best friend. And then he hooked up with my other best friend twice at parties I was at, and they all lied to me for a year about it. And I found out right before I graduated high school. So that was like detrimental at the same time. I, I found out that like, um, there was an affair with my parents and I just lost the deception. And like the, I had no idea. I had no fucking idea that that happened. And that's also being autistic. It's like not being able to read that someone would be health unhealthy and like thinking back on it, there's people, um, who came up to me and they were just like, yeah, like you can do better. And I would get upset. I was like, no, I love him. And like, didn't even read into the implied, like he's a piece of shit. Like you <laughs> need to get out of there, but that's also autistic. I was just like, no, like I trust what he says to me, like face value, literal, whatever. Um, anyways, I was so messed up after that that my dad helped me get a job at a heli skiing company when I was 18, um, in BC. So I moved there at 18 years old and it was so different being in a social environment. That wasn't my small town that I grew up in. I was like, Oh, I am attractive. People yeah. like me. And then like, I started copying a girl and I was just like, Oh, they like me even more. This is cool. And then like went back to my hometown and people did not like me at all. I was just like, this is so fucking weird. And I was like, I'm leaving again. So I went back to the heli scene company again. And it was like kind of a similar pattern. But then going back to Calgary and telling people about like all the boys I hooked up with. So I was like, oh, I am attractive. Like boys like me, like cool. Mm -hmm. But they didn't actually like me. They were just using me. <laughs> and it was just like, um, and then like I got, I got yelled at for that or like telling friends about stuff that I did. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to leave again. And then like I then decided to move to Tofino um, which is like Canada's Hawaii basically, but a lot colder and foggier. <laughs> um, but it's like, I decided to move to Tofino and like, that's where like the, that was like year two of like the hippie girl, like really came out to shine. And, um, I don't know. It was like every new place that I went, people were always interested in the new girl. They were like, who's this? And it's like, I never saw myself as conventionally pretty. And I really struggled with the way that I looked. Um, I shaved my head for cancer in grade six and I was misgendered for like a year and like didn't really identify with femininity until that happened because people treated me better when I was like very feminine presenting. And like, um, I figured out like, I wasn't just like, I wasn't like weird or awkward. I was like eccentric or mm -hmm. like the like quirky, weird, pretty girl if I like looked pretty. So like, you know, like moving to a new place, it was like, oh, like they're interested in the pretty new girl, like learn how to fit in, copy somebody, figure out what everybody's interested in to emulate those same interests, be able to talk about them. And it's just like, I all of a sudden had a lot of friends where I never really had friends. And it was like, but they weren't friends. They were just people that were interested in the idea of me, but they didn't actually like me. Yeah. And, but I didn't understand the difference because I was autistic and I didn't know I was autistic. So, um, in Tofino, I ended up in a relationship with my previous psychologist thinks he's a sociopath, but he was 30 and I was 19. Um, and I was assaulted multiple times and it was a very emotionally, mentally, and physically abusive relationship. Um, and he like groomed me and I was really fucked up. So I, when I left there, it was like, I didn't realize I thought my like hippie self-help groups and, or like not groups, but like books and like spiritualism. And <clears throat> I thought I was okay, but I wasn't I actually like learned even more harmful, like traumatic, uh, response behaviors. Um, I didn't realize it. And then from there I moved to Fernie and then every relationship that I had in Fernie, Fernie was like my destruction phase. And I wonder if anybody's going to listen to this that I knew from Fernie, but Fernie was mm -hmm. like, where like, I like tried hardcore drugs for the first time. Like I intent, like it was probably like the most severe level of trying to copy people. Like this is where the mask like developed to a level where like, I didn't even really know who I 
was anymore. Um, I made decisions and I did things that made me think I was a horrible person, but I was just severely traumatized and autistic. And I didn't know how to cope or exist. Um, and in this space, I thought I had friends that were going to be like my best friends for life. Like I thought that they were going to invite me to their weddings and I was going to move there permanently. And like, that was the goal. But then like, at the end of the day, it was like, they didn't actually care. And I was like, okay, on to the next town. <laughs> and then, um, the first place that I traveled internationally was New Zealand. And I decided to move into a van in New Zealand with a boy that I'd been dating for three months. <laughs> the, sh the short sightedness on that decision was like, fuck, that was a bad idea. It was like, like flew to another country. And like, anytime I move somewhere new, it's not an easy transition. Like I, I realized a big part of my mask is pretending to be easygoing. I am not an easygoing person at all. I don't like change. I don't like yeah. <laughs> disruptions to my routine. And at this time I had like a very strict routine with my appearance, but we were traveling with his friends who like one of the girls dating his best friend was supposed to be my friend, but we're not really friends, which I've learned recently. Um, and we never really were friends. And it was like, they were all just so effortless and like blonde and tanned and just like, could just like look fluid. And I would literally go to the bathroom and I would straighten my hair and I would put on just like a little bit of makeup. And if anybody ever saw me, it would like cause a meltdown. And I just like, I couldn't handle the change and like the speed that everybody wanted to do things. And I always had to do things that other people wanted to do. And like, I didn't, I didn't know at the time that I was experiencing like ex severe distress because I was autistic, but they mm -hmm. thought I was rude and I was like self-centered. And like, I like in the mornings, like I really struggled with mornings and like getting up, it was like immediate socialization. It's like, no, like I need to like chill for a little bit. So like my boyfriend would get up and he would start cooking dinner. And then he got mad at me because it was like, you're lazy. You don't care about this relationship. Like, and I would stay in bed or like they would go surfing and I would stay in like you never had an ounce of alone time to regulate. It was being switched on all the time and I was exhausted. So I'd stay in the van by myself and rewatch my favorite show, which they mm -hmm. thought was like selfish and weird. And like, I was just like, like everything. And then like we broke up and I moved to Wanaka, New Zealand. He went back to Canada and then in Wanaka, New Zealand, um, that first season, it was like a similar pattern to Fernie, like had unhealthy behaviors with dating boys. And like, I thought I had like a addiction to intimacy, um, like sex addiction for a little bit. And, um, just like, again, like figured out who to copy, how to fit in. People were interested in the new girl. I'm a musician. I'm a skier. I'm into cool things like drunk Tori. Like my drunk personality's name is tornado. People like tornado because when they're drunk, you don't have to be anything to be drunk with somebody else. That's something I learned in high school that like the stoners or like the kids that like to party, you don't need to be anybody as long as you want to party. Yeah. And so it's like, Drunk Tori, like speaks primarily in sound effects, like Echo Lokia or however you say it, loves to do stunts. That's like vestibular, whatever, like uh, inputs and like is just like super rowdy and like running around and like people love that. So like I was always that. And it was it was interesting. And then like dating like different boys and then dating this one like really, really good egg, like this one good boy where our relationship wasn't about sex primarily. It was like I just like, that's where I realized I had PTSD because my reactions to the way that he treated me were not logical. Every other relationship mm. was traumatic. So they were logical, but these ones were not. And that was like, holy fuck. So then moved to Japan, repeated bad behaviors, but again, found somebody to copy. I can tell you exactly who I copied every single place that I've lived. And it impacted my mask. And in every single one of these places, I thought I had real relationships because I thought people actually liked me for me and cared about me, but they didn't. They liked the mask because I copied it from somebody else. And there was no depth to my relationship. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to form in-depth relationships. And now that I'm living in Calgary and I've been in one place for the longest period of time since I graduated high school, um, I'm now 29 years old. Uh, I have like real relationships for the first time in my life. And now like I see all these people that were my friends on social media and like, they would never think to invite me to their wedding and all of them are getting married. Mm. They would never think to reach out to catch up. Um, they see me in Fernie and they don't come up and talk to me because my boyfriend has a place there now. And I just traveling in the mask is traveling was my mask. I was the easygoing nomad hippie girl or whatever like 
you know, specific stereotype I needed to be to fit into a space. And I was an expert chameleon and I Mm -hmm. used the tools that I learned in sales, um, and working at like five-star resorts, uh, to learn how to network, get jobs. Um, I don't know. It it was interesting. Like people that did get to know me well there, it was like, yeah, like social media Tory is very different from real life Tory or like, you know, work Tory is very different from home Tory or like, you know, it was always like different. It was just like, I didn't realize I was trying to be who I needed to be, but, um, traveling with other people was very traumatic for me. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember spending that much time, like the way that I would copy other girls, um, with like the hair, the way that they dress, what they were interested in. Nobody ever caught it until I lived in a van. Um, cause the other girl that I was traveling with, like picking up on how people say things and not realizing it like echolokia. So like the way they pronounce certain words of the slang that they use, um, or like starting to copy, like how people dress. Like I was very uncomfortable in my clothes. I felt like I didn't fit in and I stood out. I don't like standing out. I like to fit in. I don't want people to notice that like I was different or weird. That's part of the mask. And, um, so like she bought a pair of overalls and then like I bought a pair of overalls. And I remember we were hiking one day and I was like talking and I said things similar to how she said them. And she was like, stop fucking copying me. Like, oh. stop fucking copying me. And I was like, I'm not copying you. And then like, we both got tattoos by the same people when we lived in Fernie. And she mm-hmm. thought that I copied her tattoo because it was similar, but it was by the same artist with a similar style. And it was just like, she like, like tuned into it but nobody else had at that point. And she got severely mad at me. And I was just like, my response to it was like, well, you're not that unique. Like I didn't even realize I was doing it. That's part of the thing. It's like looking back on it now, I know that I was doing it. And there were times I did consciously do it, but this time I didn't. Mm -hmm. Like this was like, honestly, just my nervous system being like, you feel uncomfortable. Your anxiety is through the roof. Like, what do we do to fix this? And it was like falling back on previous behaviors. And, um, yeah, she just, she picked up on it. And my response was like, you're not that unique. Lots of girls have overalls and have traditional tattoos. Like, wow. <laughs> I was kind of like, like that defense mechanism. was like, how dare you call me out on my masking? <laughs> but like, not knowing that that's what it was. Right. But like, I've never been like, like my, my boyfriend and I actually just booked flights to Portugal uh, in June. We're going to a wedding, not someone I know, but he knows we're invited mm-hmm. to weddings that people he knows, but not me, uh, for people I know, but I, it's fine. Um, I don't know why that's so hard. I think it's cause I'm almost 30. It just feels like really like coming home that I haven't really been successful in forming relationships my whole life. Um, but, uh, I've never traveled with somebody like this before. It's always been by myself. And I have like a routine when I travel, I know exactly what seat and where I need to be in the plane to like mm-hmm. feel comfortable. I have like a routine when I get to the airport, when I get onto the plane, I have like my sensory safety kit, which has like everything I need to make it through an overnight trip. I know exactly like where I need to go to get on my next form of transportation. I know where I'm going when I get there, I have everything planned. So like doing this with somebody else is just like, like he was like, Oh, I don't need to pay to pick a seat. I'll just take what I'll get. And I was like, no, I'm paying oh. a shit ton of money for this. So I was like, I cannot, my first long-term flight was like, I cried the whole way, the whole way. I got stuck in an aisle seat. It sucked. And I will never, ever do it again. And I just like, the other thing is that like, when I get to a new place, the transition of being in the new place, I would always be super emotional and not functional. And I would like call my mom crying. And like, like, I think I was having like meltdowns because I was struggling with the change, Mm -hmm. but then like, I prefer like moving somewhere new because then I have the opportunity to get oriented. I've never just traveled somewhere as an adult with the purpose of spending a couple weeks there. If that makes sense. That's really hard, especially internationally, like within like BC and Alberta and Canada. Like I do heaps of ski trips and camping trips with that. Like that's different, but this is like going to a completely different country where I'm completely out of any comfort or normality. And I'm like, I don't know. I just like bought this Excel spreadsheet so that I can like autistically plant everything. And I'm like researching like the towns we're in and like, what's our bed and breakfast look like? And- <laughs> oh my God. When you say that, that's hilarious. I literally have two Excel spreadsheets right now. Cause I leave next Tuesday for a 24 day trip where it's, it's weird. I'm doing the opposite of what you just said. I'm going to a couple of different places in Europe by myself with the intention of only being there for a few days. Um, because, I actually like the challenge of be- so I also have ADHD so Same. like I love that I love the novelty so like when it comes to traveling I don't 
it's so weird. Like I need a routine. So I do do things the same way when I get to different places, but I don't like staying in the same place for a long amount of time at all. So like right now I actually have a spreadsheet with like literally all of my flight details. And so far the first two stops, I literally have every day planned out. Okay. So I'm going to go to this place to this place to this place. And that's just so that like when I get there, I need a plan, but then like I actually plan in spontaneous time too, because I'm like, Oh, what if I get there and I like meet somebody or I like find out about something cool. So I have to plan in time to be spontaneous. spontaneous. Yeah. But like, yeah, that's totally my whole thing. I, I have to have spreadsheets. I'm a planner, 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 planner. Um, yeah, I think that like, totally resonates. Yeah. I think like my version of planning is just like, like I have ADHD and autism as well. And I always say like in my TikTok videos, it's like having a domestic fight. It's like the ADHD is like, let's move around all the furniture because you're understimulated and it makes you feel good. And then the autism the next day is like, everything's different. I can't find what I need. And you keep opening up the wrong cupboard or like looking for the wrong thing. And it's like low key meltdown. You're like, fuck. But the, yes. um, but like with with like planning things and the need for consistency for me, it's like I have to plan them so that I have everything I could possibly need to be comfortable if a spontaneous situation arises. So like, do I have a change of clothes to adapt to like every possible weather situation that could possibly happen? Like, do I know where we're going and do I have an escape route if I have to be there? Like anytime I go into a new place, I always find where the bathroom is. That's like mm -hmm. one of the first things that I do because it's an escape route. So it's like having consistency within spontaneity is yes. like exactly what you said, but that's like, that's definitely how I travel. I I'm honestly the best version of myself when I'm being a gremlin in the outdoors and I'm camping because it, it allows me to like enjoy things without worrying about the mask. And part of the mask is my appearance, which I'm really trying to work hard on. I actually like looked like a total gremlin before this call. And I was like, I think she might put this on TikTok. So I'm going to not, look like a gremlin. <laughs> um, but I like, yeah. So it's like consistency within spontaneity. And then like, trying to assess like, okay, you're like overstimulated, but your ADHD is like, I'm bored, but you're like overstimulated. It's like, this is not the right time to do this. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, this is going to be bad. So it's like, I don't know, being an ADHD person, it's, it's really interesting, actually speaking of that on TikTok, the amount of misinformation there is. Yeah. Um, because they are two different disorders and there is overlap in the presentation of certain things, but the root cause is different. And the ADHD experience is very different to just the singular ADHD or autistic experience. Absolutely. That is a great point. Yes, because I feel like a lot of content, especially when it comes to ADHD, it gets geared toward like, I don't want to say glamorizing it, but like cutesifying it. And it's like, yes, we don't want to like be all somber and like always only talk about what's what's bad about it but if you only present it as like this cute little like thing that makes me quirky it diminishes how it like debilitates people and then it also doesn't it, and then it also kind of takes away from the conversation when people who are all ADHD say oh this is my ADHD and the, and, and this is my autism because it's, they're not the same thing. And the, and the way you experience ADHD by just having ADHD is completely different from an ADHD year and vice versa also with like autism. But like, that's actually a good point that I wanted to bring up really quickly too, is like, um, so like, I don't know, like I, I, I appreciate these kind of conversations that we're having, right? We're talking about our lives and genuine things and how they present in our lives as opposed to trying to curate and like basically mask. I feel like a lot of TikTok or like autistic TikTok is starting to become a performance. And I don't like that. I want to move away from it and continue to have like these really authentic conversations about what it genuinely is like to live as an autistic person. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I when I watch other people's TikToks and they're doing like you know, like the music and they're like, oh, this and this. And like, I think I have like one video that's utilizing a trend like that. But every time I try to do it, I just like get frustrated because I'm just like, well, I'm just going to like emotionally vomit and verbally <laughs> vomit my experience. And people seem to really connect with that. So that's fine. But like, I don't really like, I don't know. It's funny, like the high energy, like autistic expression and my low energy autistic expression are like very different. Um, mm -hmm. It's like either monotone, no emotion, like monologues, like awkward cadence, tone, like rhythm of my voice, or it's like super emotive and just like, pfft. and I don't know if that's influenced by the ADHD or caffeine. I haven't really figured it out yet. Um, 
but it's one or the other. A weird combination, maybe. It's a weird combination, (laughs) yeah. Um, But sorry, finish your thought on that. No, no, it's okay. I actually lost my train of thought on that. But you know what? I don't want to feel like schizophrenic. I really enjoy talking to you. And I would love to have you on a future episode because I was like, I have notes here. And there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to like touch on, but then we moved to like another topic, which I fully enjoy. But um, yeah, I think I'm going to I'm going to bring us home, but we should definitely chat again. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank I want the questions. To- I'd be happy to answer them. For sure. Yes. Um, but yeah, what I like to do whenever I wrap up the episode is um, give you an opportunity. Like if there's any like parting words or words of encouragement or just like thoughts you want to leave the audience with, um, please share that. And then if there's... Um, uh, any projects you're working on or anything um, like you want to plug, just let us know where we can find you. Okay, sure. Yeah, I think um, like before I introduced myself at the beginning, and I think before you started recording, I wanted to share something I heard in a TV show recently. Okay. And it's about like, um, I don't know if, have you seen the show Hunters? No. No. Okay. It's, it's interesting. Um, really there's like some tonal conflicts in the way that the director like put it together. Like it's like really serious structure about like uh like nazis in per- post world war ii america and like the paperclip project and then like this group of jewish people hunting nazis in america uh, and this like flashbacks to like internment camps and that's really serious but then it has like all these like humorous things thrown in and the guy that ends up being the bad guy it sucks that this came from him but he went into this monologue about the concept of being seen and like being like fully seen as a human being and it's like that's when that's something that everybody needs and everybody searches for. And so like unmasking and to be like fully seen is the most like humanizing and validating experience you can have. Cause it's like, you know, like if you think about like the Holocaust and this is like a very stark contrast, but there is like genocide against disabled people as well. Um, and ableism throughout history. Um, but the concept of dehumanizing somebody to not see them as their human self to participate in identity spread, to believe in biases and like that segregation, like it is, it is the most dehumanizing, debilitating thing you can do to somebody. So unmasking is kind of like being seen for the first time. And it's like really impactful. Um, And when it comes to unmasking, my favorite motto is the more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. So (laughs) it's like, pay attention to how you feel internally. Does this situation feel bad? Is that not how you would have authentically uh, experienced something? A really good book is Unmasking Autism by Dr. Devin Price. Um, They have a workable, like a downloadable PDF with the audio book where you can go through and you actually work through the exercises. And it does help to point out where you are masking, but being your authentic self is really important. Um, Also, the way that you identify to being autistic is also important. Um, So like, you know, younger people that are growing up with the autism diagnosis in like a modern day where it isn't so stigmatized um, and it's becoming more accepted with the neurodivergence movement and representation, they don't feel this attachment to the autistic identity as much. They're like, I don't need to tell anybody I'm autistic. Like, I just I know this and I trust myself. And it's like, if you're one of those people, groovy, you still fit in with the autistic community. If you're one of the people where autism is, you you are autistic, it is your identity, you cannot separate it and you need to be verbal about it. That's also okay too. I land in the middle now, which is weird because I used to be one side and then I was the other. So the more you fuck around, the more you're going to find out. Do all <laughs> the research, practice unmasking. That's pretty much it. But you deserve to be seen. And that is something that I'm experiencing for the first time in my life. And I think all of us kind of deserve that. So that's part of deconstructing neurodivergence, as you say. But um, relative to like my personal plugs, I if this was like me on a ski podcast, I'd like list off my ski sponsors and like <laughs> do all that stuff. But um, you can find me on TikTok. I'm not as active on there because t- autistic TikTok's gotten a little weird. We didn't really yeah. touch on starseed things. Um, or like, you know, there's like, that's like throwing some fire in, but every time I open up TikTok on my for you page, I'm just getting fed stuff that is really uncomfortable and harmful for the autistic community. So I also just wanted to point out that don't believe everything you hear online and do your own research. Do not participate in confirmation bias. Um, like bottom up reasoning, like the starseed stuff is fucking bullshit and yeah, we're not going to dip into that right now, but you can find me on TikTok at unmasked tornado. Um, and if you 
want to check me out on Instagram. My Instagram is mostly like ski stuff, although I am trying to come out more as autistic on there uh, as well. Uh, but it's at Tori A. Alina. So T O R I A A L I N A um, on there. And yeah, if you want to, if you're in Canada or the United States and you are interested in skiing and finding like a, a group of people to progress with and kind of get into it, you can check out, uh, womb tang at womb.tang on Instagram. We also have a meme page at womb cork. Um, the meme page is where we share kind of like feminist memes about the industry and like similar, sh like shreds and sends and all that kind of stuff. And then I also have a podcast, big stick energy. You can find it on the out of collective podcast network. Um, it's on all major streaming networks and yeah, that's, uh, I think that's pretty much me. Yeah. The more you fuck around, the more you'll find out and you deserve to be seen. Those are like my ending closing statements. And that's perfect. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you so much. Tori. Yeah. We definitely are going to have to talk again because we didn't even touch on Moon Tang and Big Stick Energy. Uh, but I will make sure that I leave links to um, your podcast and your all of your social media when this episode goes live. Again, thank you so much, Tori. This was such a blast. I want to thank you guys for stopping by and spending a little time with me today. Today is the season one finale, and I want to thank you guys so much for coming along with me on this journey. It has indeed been a journey of discovery for not only myself, but I'm sure for all of the wonderful people that graced me with their presence and joined me on episodes during this first season. I am happy to announce that season two is already in the works and there is going to be a little bit of a format change going forward. I have some pretty epic and impressive guests already lined up for season two and I would really like to focus more on them and their individual journeys. So the episodes moving forward will have more of an interview style where I and probing the guests more about them and their experiences and their thoughts on different topics, but still keeping it a bit conversational and letting the conversation flow naturally back and forth. Um, but I do definitely want to make sure that I'm highlighting and giving the guests more of an opportunity to share their experiences and share their thoughts on specific topics. So going forward, you're going to hear a little bit of a difference in the structure, but the essence and the overall spirit of Beyond Deconstructing will remain the same. The goal is to highlight the varied and multifaceted experiences of actually autistic people and how we present and how we view the world. And this way, it'll just give you guys as my audience more of an opportunity to get to know the guests. Because if you follow me on social media or if you uh, you know, listen to or view my vlogs, then you already have an opportunity to hear from me and hear my perspective primarily. In the podcast going forward, I really want to be highlighting the guests and their experiences and their perspectives on things. So join me back here on Monday, September 25th for the season two premiere. And again, I am so freaking excited for who we have lined up. Um, I'm going to keep it stum for now, but make sure you're following me at deconstructing.neuro on Instagram and on Twitter as well, because over the summer, most likely in August, about a month before the premiere, I'm going to start doing promo work for season two. And that's when I will announce who will be on season two. But in the meantime, I thank you guys again for all of your support. Thank you.